Right Worshipful Brother Theophilus Arputraj Devajanam, Right Worshipful the District Grand Master of the District Grand Lodge of Madras, Right Worshipful Brother Dato Jairaj Ratna Swami, Right Worshipful the District Grand Master of the District Grand Lodge of the Eastern Archipelago, Right Worshipful Brother Farad Nilgiriya, Right Worshipful the District Grand Master of, of the District Grand Lodge of Sri Lanka, Right Worshipful Brother David Chichinadze, Right Worshipful the Assistant Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Georgia, Most Worshipful Brother Jacques Hugbert, past Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of the Czech Republic, Right Worshipful Brethren, Very Worshipful Brethren, Worshipful Brethren and Brethren all, good evening and a warm welcome to a great evening of learning and development from the learning and development team of the District Grand Lodge of Madras. Before we start a little bit of housekeeping as usual, may we request all to kindly keep your mics muted during the entire course of the session. If you wish to comment or to ask a question, kindly type it in the chat option or alternatively, pre please reserve it till the end of the session and raise your hand using the option in Zoom. We've provided for a brief question and answer session at the end of this module. May I now request Virtual Brother Elango Rafael, President, the District Board of General Purposes for his welcome address. Virtual Brother Elango. Thank you, George. Good evening, brother. Um, on behalf of the Right Worshipful, the District Grand Master of the District Grand Lodge of Madras and the Brethren of the District, I have much pleasure in welcoming First Brother Tony Harvey. On behalf of the District, we thank you very much for accepting our invitation and uh, taking part in this session. We look forward to a great evening. I also welcome Right Worshipful Brother Dato Deiraj Ratnaswamy, Right Worshipful the District Grand Master of the District Grand Lodge of Eastern Archipelago, Right Worshipful Brother Farad Nilgiriya, Right Worshipful the District Grand Master of the District Grand Lodge of Sri Lanka, Right Worshipful Brother David Chinchanadze, Right Worshipful the Assistant Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Georgia, and. Uh, I also welcome our own uh, Right Worshipful the District Grand Master, Right Worshipful Brother Theo Philisar Pumaraj Devanyanam, Worshipful Deputy District Grand Master, Worshipful Brother Matthew Joseph, Worshipful Assistant District Grand Master, Worshipful Brother Dulip uh, Sahadeva, Most Worshipful Brother, Worshipful Brethren, Right Worshipful Brethren, Worshipful Very Worshipful Brethren, Worshipful Brethren, and Brother in all. Our LND team lead has done a great job in connecting to uh, all across the world. We can see today. So I welcome all of you from India and across the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Worshipful Brother Elango. May I now request Right Worshipful Brother Theophilus Arputraj Devajnanam, Right Worshipful, the District Grand Master of the District Grand Lodge of Madras, for his opening address. Right Worshipful Brother. Uh, I'd love to unmute uh, Right Worshipful District Grand Master. He's muted. Uh, right Worshipful District Grand Master, you're on mute. Uh, request you to kindly unmute. Uh, most worshipful brethren, right worshipful brethren, very worshipful brethren and brother in all. Um, I think this effort of our LND team is quite commendable because we've attracted attention from all over the world. And I thank right worshipful brother Tony Harvey for being here to address our LND group. And <clears throat> I'm sure, brethren, the topic of the address this evening is the future of masonry. Now, this is something we are all very concerned about. And I'm sure that this evening, we will have some highlights and guidelines as to where we are going as Freemasons. Thank you, brethren. I will now hand over to whoever is next. <laughs> Thank you so much, Right Worshipful District Grandmaster. Brethren, now I have the honor of introducing the speaker for the evening, 
virtual brother Tony Harvey. The pandemic in induced lockdowns were in, in a way beneficial for the craft. That period infused technology into our ancient craft and we witnessed Masonic education being disseminated like never before. It is during these times where I got the opportunity to attend a session in which virtual brother Tony was the keynote speaker. Our admiration for his in-depth knowledge and on the subject and his eloquence in presenting continues to grow to this date. Virtual brother Tony is a writer and a speaker who has held active many an active role in local and national levels in both scouting and in Freemasonry. He's been a scout for over, over 50 years. He was initiated into Pioneer Lodge number 9065, the Scout Lodge of Derbyshire in June 1991. He's a past master of four lodges and is the current master of Knott's Installed Masters Lodge number 3595. He's a member, founder, or honorary member of lodges and chapters in London, seven provinces, and three overseas districts. He's been a Freemason for over, over 30 years and has held provincial roles in the secretarial membership, mentoring, learning and development, charity, and communications area of Freemasonry. Tony conceived and was the main author of the United Grand Lodges Members Pathway, which in June 2019, the then pro Ma Grandmaster described as a game changer. Tony has held a number of Masonic le lectures, including the Prestonian Lecture of 2012 with Scouting and Freemasonry, two parallel organizations, which he has delivered in more than 130 occasions. <clears throat> Tony's talks and articles combine historical analysis with an understanding of organizational development to promote a forward thinking approach to Freemasonry based on the evolution of our Lord's practices while retaining our fundamental meaning and purpose. He encourages lodges to adopt a member-centric approach more suited for the 21st century lifestyles. Tony is a grand officer in the craft, Royal Arch, and Mark, and in two other orders in the English Freemasonry. He is currently the Provincial Grand Membership Officer of Nottinghamshire and the Head of Learning and Development in West Kent. Brethren, without much ado, let me now hand over the virtual floor to Worshipful Brother Tony Harvey. Well, George, uh, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. Right Worshipful District Grand Master, distinguished brethren and brethren all, thank you for inviting me today to your uh, meeting. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I'm speaking from the UK where it is just uh, coming up to a quarter to two in the afternoon. So if I slip into referring to the afternoon, please, please forgive me. And I'm very conscious of that we have on this call people literally from all over the world and uh, which is a, it's a great privilege to speak to you. Brethren, when I first became a Freemason over 30 years ago, I was told that things don't change very much in Freemasonry. Based on my own experience, I must disagree. And if we look back further still over Masonic history for the last 300 years, I know that Freemasonry has been constantly evolving, just like every other successful organization. In this talk, I'm going to consider United Grand Lodge's current vision for the future. I will examine changes in our membership over the last 100 years and demonstrate that we have not always done it this way, despite what some will try to tell you. In fact, I believe we have survived until now and often thrive precisely because we have evolved. I will make the case for Freemasonry to continue to evolve and change, and I will justify that by reference to the nature of evolution, historic precedent, and by the need to reconnect with our communities and be relevant if we are to attract new members. I'm going to draw on my experiences as a change manager and my work with other changing and successful organisations, including the Scout Movement. And I will finish by suggesting ways in which lodges can manage a change process that will help to ensure their future. Now, before I do that, I'm just going to mute everybody again to avoid any breakthrough. And uh, you should still be able to hear me. Okay. 
So, brethren, in July 2021, United Grand Lodge published its new vision for the future. That vision is to attract those from all backgrounds and walks of life, enabling them to develop into more thoughtful and confident people, to inspire and challenge them, to practice the core values we celebrate, integrity, friendship, respect, charity, in their private and their public lives, to cement our reputation as a force for good in our communities and society at large, and as a thriving organization that people aspire to join. United Grand Lodge went on to define its mission as follows. Over the next seven years, we will enhance our reputation as a thriving organization that people aspire to join, and we will broaden our membership across all age groups. Now, brethren, I should declare an interest in this work. First of all, in my 2012 Prestonian lecture, I called on Freemasonry to follow the example of the Scout Movement, which reversed its declining membership by updating the way that the organization works while retaining its core values. Scouting has been growing ever since. My second interest is that I have worked on two of United Grand Lodge's strategic projects aimed at achieving our vision, namely the Members Pathway and Solomon, the online uh, Masonic portal of learning materials. However, I'm speaking to you in a personal capacity. What I'm about to say does not necessarily represent the views of United Grand Lodge or any of its boards, committees, working groups, or indeed any province or district. And at no point in my talk, or indeed in the Grand Lodge plans, is there any suggestion that we should change our ritual or dumb down the meaning of the Masonic experience? Far be from us any such intention. Finally, I am addressing my points to all of us rather than to any particular lodge or individual, so there's no criticism implied at any point. However, I do hope that you will consider the issues I raise and that you will respond as you think fit. Perhaps your lodges can put some time aside to discuss how they might evolve and change to secure a strong and healthy future. And towards the end of this talk, I will offer a way in which you can do precisely that. But let's first of all then, look at the background to United Grand Lodge of England vision. The membership of our lodges has been in decline for the last 40 years. At the end of the 20th century, we had well over 300,000 members. We now have less than 180,000. However, our organization developed its governance, its infrastructure, its cost base, the number of lodges, and indeed its Masonic halls to suit and meet the needs of that higher membership. For example, between the 1920, or sorry, between 1920 itself and the early 1970s, the number of lodges doubled. The rate of growth slowed in the 1990s. And today our membership is back to around what it was in 1920. But the number of lodges has not reduced in proportion. We are left with more lodges than our membership can sustain and many of them are getting weaker. In business terms, the market is flooded with supply but demand has shrunk. And just as in business, the danger is that the suppliers, which in this case are our lodges, will reduce quality to compete for customers, which in this case are our new members. Despite the overall fall in membership, some lodges are thriving and growing. So I'm just going to mute us all again. Somebody, I think, has opened the microphone. Excuse me, brother. Despite the overall fall in membership, some lodges are thriving and growing. Across this country, at least, Freemasonry is proving very popular among young professional men, especially where it has the means to become a regular part of their social lives. Young members groups are particularly successful in this respect. And United Grand Lodge researched the difference between struggling and thriving lodges, and we use those findings when we develop the members pathway. Now this fall in numbers, has affected our attitudes. 
There is a widespread view that Freemasonry as an organization, at least, is in difficulty. However, when we last had the current number of members, which was back, to when, uh, back in 1920, we were then recognized and respected by the public, and we were then perceived as successful. We had certainly had a reputation as a force for good in 1920, and we were then seen as a thriving organization that people aspire to join. So perhaps today we're comparing ourselves too much with the boom years of the 1960s. And that, of course, is natural. It's within living memory. However, not, if we do not develop a sense of optimism, we will not make the changes needed if we are to be recognized, respected, and attractive once again. After all, nothing positive can come oh, from negative. <laughs> After all, nothing positive can come from negative thinking. So perhaps we should consider the post-war rise in membership as having the effect of a tidal wave. It created a temporary increase, but it did not shift our underlying numbers. Brethren, this brings me to evolution. Charles Darwin observed that all populations change over time. His theory of natural selection explains why some groups within populations thrive while others fail. Essentially, small variations between those groups result in some of them being favored over others in the struggle for limited resources. Darwin himself said, there is one general law leading to the advancement of all organic beings, namely this, multiply, vary, let the strongest live and the weakest die. Now, perhaps a more familiar quote is by Medjinson, who said, it's not the strongest that survive, nor the fittest, but those best suited to their environment and best able to manage change. Now, if we apply these points to Freemasonry, then we should realize that we are just one organization a man might choose to join. Equally, he has plenty of lodges to choose from. So each lodge has to make its offer attractive to that man. Evolution also tells us that we cannot expect all of our lodges to survive, only those that are willing and able to adapt to their changing circumstances and environments. Now, currently, around 2.24 million men in England and Wales regularly give time to clubs, societies, and organizations related to hobbies, social activities, and recreation. Does Freemasonry in those countries have a fair share of this market? Are we becoming more attractive or less? Have we introduced small variations that are favorable to men making a choice of which organization to join? Or are we resisting evolution in our quest to maintain those traditions and practices that favored the lifestyles of our forebears, but which are no longer relevant to today's man? Brethren, if we resist evolution, we will die. We must be willing to make those small variations over time in the hope that some at least will be relevant and will find favor with today and tomorrow's man. Back in 2016, I watched a television program in which the popular entertainers, Ant and Deck, followed the, I don't know whether you're familiar with them in, uh, in India or elsewhere, but I'll tell you more about them shortly. But these, these two entertainers followed the then Prince of Wales for a year and observed his work with the Prince's Trust. His Royal Highness, now King Charles III, had formed the trust in 1976, shortly after he left the Royal Navy. In the following 40 years, the trust had grown to become a highly respected organization offering young people from difficult backgrounds the opportunity to make a good life for themselves. In one interview, either Ant or Deck, and quite frankly, I can't tell them apart unless they're standing side by side, but one of them asked His Royal Highness about the future for the trust. And he replied that it would be wrong to continue doing things that were right a few years ago, just because they worked then. The trust, he said, and these are his words, 
must evolve if it is to survive. It must adapt to continue to be attractive and relevant. Now, incidentally, if you don't know who Ant and Deck are, let me explain that they're two of the most popular entertainers we have here in the United Kingdom, and they were born in the same year as the Prince's Trust was founded. They've been on our television screens since the late 1980s. They're much loved by the public at large, and they seem to me to have their fingers on the pulse of this country today. If we don't have at least some understanding of the world as experienced by today's men in their 40s, we may well struggle to attract those very men to Freemasonry. So this brings me to change. Brethren, let's look at some of the changes in the world outside Freemasonry in the last 40 years or so. Well, certainly family life here at least is very different from 40 years ago. Today, men here are expected to take a full part in bringing up the family and in helping in the home. In today's families, in today's families, it's likely that both parents, if there are two, are working and probably working long hours too. With increased social mobility, many families don't have the local support structures of the extended family to help them. Today, single sex organizations have to justify their existence. They're the exception rather than the norm. In addition, fewer people would profess to have any religious conviction, although there is perhaps an increased interest in spirituality. In the last 40 years, there's been a growth in anti-establishment thinking and a rise in individuality and unique expression. The popularity of body art is just one example of this. The consequence of these many changes is, is that a smaller proportion of the adult male population is likely to be available for Freemasonry. Certainly fewer might perceive it to be for them unless we become more visible and better recognized. The growth in the range of leisure activities and opportunities then mean that we must compete with some very attractive pursuits if we are to bring good men into the craft. Remember, evolution tells us that it is those best suited to their environment and best able to manage change that survive in competitive circumstances. Our lodges must rise to this challenge. Now, brethren, I'm an optimist. So let me start from the point that here at least, 2.24 million men spend time as a member of a club, society, or organization. That's quite a lot. Now in 2012, United Grand Lodge commissioned a report by the Social Issues Research Center, which found that a quarter of all men surveyed would consider joining Freemasonry, being attracted by belonging to a group that served its community. And the director of this institute said at the time, despite the many changes taking place in society, or perhaps because of them, our desire to be part of something and to help other people is undimmed. It's here that Freemasonry has an important part to play. So what then has changed in the craft in the last 40 years? And indeed, what's changed in the last 100? I've already explained the tidal wave effect of increased members following the two world wars and how over the last 40 years or more, the total numbers of, in membership in United Grand Lodge, including all of our districts, have returned to around what they were in 1920. Internally, there have been changes too in our rules, procedures, structure and communication. Our Book of Constitutions has evolved to accommodate the law, external regulations and technology. Therefore, many of the procedures we're asked to follow have had to change, requiring lodge officers to have new skills. New lodge offices have also been introduced. First of all, charity steward, later lodge mentor, and more recently, lodge membership officer. In 2003, the Metropolitan Grand Lodge of London was formed, bringing lodges within five miles of Freemasons Hall under its jurisdiction. Masonic bodies now communicate directly with their members using mobile, sorry, using email, social media, and other digital technologies. And if we look at Freemasonry from the outside, We've also seen a change in the public's perception of us. 
Back in 1920, Freemasonry regularly appeared in the local and national press, and we were then seen in very favorable terms. The then Grand Master, His Royal Highness, the Duke of Connaught and Strathern, appeared often in the media in full Masonic dress. The Programme Master at the time, the Earl of Amptill, wore regalia at public events. The President of the Board of General Purposes, Sir Alfred Robbins, who was a journalist, ensured that we had a very positive relationship with the media. Freemasonry then was visible, was recognized and was respected, just as we wish it to be now. But in the 1930s, we went underground. With the rise of fascism here in Europe and its threat to Freemasonry, we hid. And unfortunately, we didn't come back into the light again until quite recently. For many years, we avoided contact with the press. We stayed silent when criticized. Our silence created a perception that we had something to hide. And as suspicion grew, we lost respect. Brethren, the more you read about Masonic history, the more you realize that for most of our existence, the craft has evolved and kept pace with the times. The Grand Lodge and its constituent lodges have adapted in response to outside and inside influences. I'll briefly outline just two examples. And forgive me, these are, these are relevant to, to English law. In, 19, sorry, in 1799, an unintended consequence of the proposed Unlawful Societies Act threatened to outlaw Freemasonry. A senior delegation from the two English Grand Lodges and from the Grand Lodge of Scotland met with the Prime Minister, William Pitt, who incidentally was not a Freemason. They agreed changes to the bill to exempt Freemasonry from its scope. Cannot imagine that happening today. However, they had to concede measures to ensure Freemasonry would not be hijacked by the seditious influences that the bill sought to respect. And some of these measures survived until the 1967 Criminal Justice Act. And more recently, following the Equality Act 2010, United Grand Lodge has introduced other adaptations to ensure that Freemasonry continues to comply with the law. And I'm sure there are local examples of adaptations that uh, have been introduced around our districts. You will find, certainly find other examples in your Lodge Minutes and in the articles in past issues of Freemasonry Today by very worshipful brother John Hamill. In the latter, John explained how things we might assume have always been done in a certain way, have actually evolved and developed over Freemasonry's history, often in response to outside influences. Now, I've been fortunate, brethren, to visit two of the three surviving time immemorial lodges that together formed the first Grand Lodge in 1717. Let me assure you, they do not keep to the practices they adopted back then. Whilst retaining some of their traditions, they have adapted and evolved over time. And today they're very efficiently run lodges, providing very meaningful Freemasonry to their members. Many other lodges that arose in the 18th century, and indeed many other fraternal organizations, have long since died simply because they did not evolve. Today, only two out of every three of all lodges ever formed continue and survive. Today, Many lodges have resisted the call to evolve and they seem unwilling to change. Their approach might have been relevant to candidates from 40 years ago, but that will not attract or retain today's man. These lodges are like the ostrich that puts its head in the sand to avoid reality. Well, brethren, Freemasonry as a whole cannot do that. Collectively, Freemasonry has to face the facts. If we refuse to do so, we may deprive future generations of the opportunity to begin to belong rather to a particular lodge or even to Freemasonry at all. Perhaps one reason such lodges have resisted evolution and change is that when we hid from the public eye, we lost our ability to sense the impact of wider change and to develop incremental responses. In other words, we became an island detached from the wider world we froze many of our practices and traditions. We perpetuated them unaltered. 
we then began to realize, or believe rather, that we've already, oh, sorry, let me start that sentence again. We then began to believe that we've always done it this way, when history tells us this is rarely, if ever, true. The reason often given for resisting change is a respect for tradition. Now, brethren, I love tradition and I enjoy many of the traditions associated with my country and its institutions. In fact, a love for tradition has been one of the reasons I've joined some organizations. Equally, I believe tradition is a wonderful servant, but a very poor master. G.K. Chesterton called it the democracy of the dead. In other words, if we allow tradition to determine our future, we are giving our predecessors a bigger say in our affairs than our current members. Our predecessors made their decisions based on the situation in their time. They could not be aware of the needs and issues our members face today. So it seems to me far better to allow tradition to evolve. One way is for each generation to make its own contribution to tradition. Past traditions can be reviewed. Those that still serve their purpose can be retained. Those that stand in the way of our future health and strength can be adapted or even removed. This approach has served many of our long-standing institutions, including the monarchy, the City of London, and our older universities, very well indeed. In fact, allowing traditions to evolve is precisely what happens in our most successful and older lodges. So today, brethren, I believe we have to reconnect with the world. We have to become sensitive to wider social influences and evolve our organization so that the way we operate is relevant and attractive. We can change many things without losing our purpose and meaning and without altering our ritual. If we don't evolve and change, as natural selection tells us, we will die. Just as so many other lodges and fraternal organizations did in the 18th and 19th centuries. So brethren, I've made the case for the craft to evolve and change, and I've justified that by reference to natural selection, to historic precedent, and by the need to be relevant if we are to attract new members. The question is, how do we change? Well, nationally, here at least, the Scout Movement has offered us a template. In that organization, when we were considering major changes at the end of the 1990s, we spent considerable time consulting our members and listening to what they told us. Then we fed back to them the results. With its online surveys and local and national discussion forums, United Grand Lodge is doing the same. The Scout Movement concluded that its core values should not be altered. United Grand Lodge has done the same. To be clear, no one is suggesting any change to our ritual, its meaning, or the nature of the Masonic experience. Scouting also concluded that the way the organization itself operated, the way it recruited, trained, and communicated with its members and with the public needed to be radically updated. We are currently going through a very similar process in Freemasonry. For example, the members pathway offers tools and techniques developed by thriving lodges for use by all of us. We now communicate direct with all of our members who register for our websites, and we are making extensive use of social media, which is the primary communication channel used by people under 50 years of age. We will soon see changes in our book of constitutions. Solomon, United Grand Lodge's online learning and development platform, now offers everyone the chance to learn about their Masonic interests at their pace. Our four, Central charities have consolidated into one organization, partly to simplify operations, to become more efficient and effective at applying their resources, but also to be better recognized and to have a bigger impact within the charity sector. Freemasonry in England and Wales, at least, is going through its most extensive change in at least 100 years. Our provinces and districts are responding and in many cases leading these changes and developments. When new initiatives are set up, Freemasons drawn from around 
the country and around our districts are recruited to working groups. National conferences are held for provincial and district secretaries, for almoners, charity stewards, mentors, membership officers, and communication officers. Provincial and district grand masters and grand superintendents are consulted on major developments and approve them, or not, before they're launched. Pilot studies are run that include provinces and lodges from across our constitution. So how do we change in our lodges? How can we manage change at the lodge level? Brethren, those of us who studied the management of change seem to agree that successful change, resulting in something that thrives, requires careful planning, consultation, and the involvement of many, and regular communication with all. In Freemasonry, we have the added requirement to maintain harmony in our lodges. So I now offer you a process that you can choose to follow that can deliver all of these results, if it's done well. It's in a series of nine steps, and I will upload into the chat area a copy of these nine steps uh, during the Q&A session. I'm not going to read them out to you. You can have a, a quick look at them there, brethren. The article uh, will be uploaded uh, during, during the rest of the session. So, brethren, just as change for the sake of change is foolish, so is resisting change just for the sake of respecting the past. Preserving practices that are no longer relevant or appropriate will never sustain us in the future. If tradition is the democracy of the dead, then as guardians and stewards of our lodges, we have a duty of care to cast our vote to ensure their future. We live in a crucial time in Freemasonry. Many lodges are showing that it's possible to change the way that they work whilst retaining our purpose, values, and the special nature of the Masonic experience. United Grand Lodge is asking us to evolve and change. It's now up to us to do so. The alternative is not something I wish to contemplate. Brethren, before I hand over for the Q&A session, may I just uh, point out that the, the talk I've just delivered, uh, a version at least of it, is included in my most recent book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful Lodges, um, a version of this talk is included as chapter four in that book. And if you're interested in, in obtaining a copy, um, there's, the, there's the link. It's published by Lewis Masonic, but you can buy it directly from me and I'll sign a copy for you, of course, and put your name in it. Um, and I'll upload the, uh, the link for that into um, the chat area as well. Um, Greg and I also... Um, uh, raise raise money for certain charities through my talks. I won't make too big a thing of that because this is a, a talk for overseas, but if anybody is interested, please let me know in the Q&A session. And with that, I'm going to hand back to George, and I look forward to um, hearing your questions and to engaging with you. Thank you very much indeed, brethren. Thank you so much, Vishal Brother Tony, for that insightful journey, exploring the historical context for change within Freemasonry. Freemasonry has survived for 300 years because it has continued to evolve. Brethren, no discourse or lecture is complete or meaningful unless the ingrained wisdom translates to action. Brother Tony has undoubtedly established that unless lodges are managed in a way that is relevant to the 21st century, and unless they connect with the local communities, they will not attract and retain members to ensure their future. Let us now look forward to formulating approaches that our lodges can take to manage their own evolution and change in a harmonious manner. Brethren, we'll now endeavor to answer questions that you may have as earlier mentioned. Kindly use the raise hand option in Zoom or alternatively type them in the chat box and please unmute yourself and ask your question only after you are prompted to do so. Brethren, the floor is open now. So did, did you want me to pick these up, George? Or are you curating them? You, you can uh, pick them up, uh, Johnny. No. Okay. You okay. Can feel free to do um, that. Brethren, uh, thank you for that opportunity. Um, can I just, before I do, um, uh, apologise if all my cultural references were to uh, the UK. Uh, I'm sure you can find many 
local examples, but it would have been wrong for me to try to have indicated those without the background that uh, that you have. Um, so uh, I, I do hope that the message uh, translates easily enough. Um, I, and I also ask you to forgive me if I pronounce your names incorrectly. So let's start with uh, Mathai. Mathai, um, can you would you like to unmute? Thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? I yes. can. I can, yeah, brother. Yes. yes. Uh, that's a wonderful talk. I'm very impressed with the fact that you were part of two organizations. When I grew up in the UK, when I was young, I was a scout member. I, I remember that that has a very strong formative influence on who I am today. So it's uh, wonderful that you're from both. My question is, where does change start? Uh, I, uh, by way of introduction, I'm a psychologist. I've, I have taught management for many years. I've done change management in a lot of organizations. So I was very interested in your presentation. But the question is, in large, where does change start? I would love uh, to, for example, launch a questionnaire in my own lodge and ask, what do you think is the heart of uh, Freemasonry and what should we keep and what should we change? Do we start there? Do we uh, start at a more senior level because we do have district level um, organizations that is probably going to start the change process? In your opinion, where does it start? What an excellent question, uh, Matt. I, and, and can I... Can I first of all uh, say thank you for acknowledging the role that the Scout movement had? I, you know, I came into Freemasonry because of Scouting, and I found the two entirely uh, compatible. And uh, uh, for me, Freemasonry has continued my moral and social and spiritual development, um, and many other aspects of my development. But to come to your question, where does change start? What a fascinating question! Uh, I'm a I'm a believer in hearts and minds. We have to shift people's hearts and minds. And for me, change in all behavior really starts at the level of our attitudes and even sometimes deeper, our values, our sense of identity. So it's very easy to, to, to impart knowledge. It's very easy to tell people information. Fairly easy for people to retain it. It's a little bit tougher um, to teach people skills and um and, and help them develop them. But the third form of learning, attitudes, uh, what we often call effective learning, is all concerned with what we, what we believe and, and our views and opinions towards things. And we have to prepare for change by getting people ready to believe that change uh, may be appropriate. So, um, you know, I, I do a lot of work in helping prepare people for that idea. In fact, the origins of this talk were exactly that. At the time when I first wrote this talk, the, the, uh, what I was trying to do was get across to um, perhaps the more senior members of our lodges, the rationale for change, to explain to them why change has already always been part of um, Freemasonry, at least a healthy Freemasonry, and to, and to justify that. What is interesting is that in the five or six years since I, I first delivered this talk, um, I think the acceptance of change is much more prevalent. Many more of us, many more of our members are accepting the need for change. And uh, so I've evolved this talk, but I'm actually even now considering how much longer this talk is necessary, because I believe that we're probably tipping that balance. However, I do recognize that that's not the case in every lodge. And I recognize, of course, that's not the case with every brother. So I go back to my comment that we need to, we need to work at the individual level um, and we need to work at the attitudinal level. In fact, in, in my book, The Seven Habits, uh, not only do I uh, include a version of this talk as chapter four, but there's a, a later chapter which is concerned with um, managing change and in particular overcoming resistance to change. And there's another chapter on lodge culture, which sometimes is, is, is the dominant set of values. And culture is the dominant set of values within a group. It's, it's how we do things around here. 
And if the culture is antagonistic towards change, uh, then that will slow things down. So there's a lot of material in there that may be of some help. Can I also, you, you mentioned, you mentioned a, a survey. And if I can direct you towards the member's pathway, because within the member's pathway, within the plan section of the member's pathway, there are some materials already developed, um, or at least there's a set of, uh, there's a, a set of questions that you can take and adapt and turn them into your own local survey. So rather than create a central survey, uh, what I did was I, I created as one of the documents in the members pathway, a whole series of issues that could be reviewed within the lodge. And essentially what you're asking your members is what's working well within the lodge, what's working not so well, um, and what would you like to see introduced and how can we improve things? So there, there are some materials within the members pathway. I'm just uploading the link for, for the plan section of the members pathway to help with that. But that material is built upon the points I've just been making, the need to, um, to get people's attitudes ready for change and to perhaps convince people uh, that change might be necessary. And perhaps um, in, I would encourage people if there is strong resistance to start small, um, to encourage people to experiment and try things out. Um, and to remember that sometimes people are not resisting change because they don't like change. Sometimes people resist change because they don't want to lose anything. Uh, I, I could probably carry on, but it's probably better if I, um, if I finish there and perhaps we can come back to that issue if, uh, if anybody wants to ask me more uh, about that later. Uh, shall I move on to Harsha? Harsha, would you like to unmute yourself? I can't. You were briefly there. Have another go. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I can. I can indeed. Okay. Hello, so, brother. Tony, thank you very much. And especially for covering such a vast area within a very short space of time. So thank you for that. I, I have a comment and a question. Um, I think the expanding membership and then retention of brethren is a challenge faced by, I believe, all of us. Um, the, my comment arises from a survey that we did in Sri Lanka in 2014 covering a sample of 100 brethren as to why they join masonry and why they stay in masonry. Um, based on that survey, what we tried to do was we try to take masonry as is and then find the value addition that masonry gives to somebody who can join. And we were targeting because of our demographics, especially the young professionals and the executives uh, in Sri Lanka. But today you're talking of change. And you also said the core should remain the same. Taking the uh, examples from the Scouts movement, the core should remain, but change the other. So my question to you is, how much do we change in the context of these things? One is our core consists of our values, rituals and the way we do things, the rules. So how much do we change in that? Number two is as districts come oh, can, in. Can I just take one question at a time? Do you, do you mind? It, it would help me process and, and, and reflect and think of something sensible to say in response. Uh, if I could just um, uh, address each question um, as it goes. Harsha, can you just summarize your question for me again? Okay, the first question is, you said maintain the core, but change. The core, in my humble opinion, consists of the values, rituals, and our rules and the way we do things. So when you, when with each other supporting each everything else, how much do we change if you say, keep the core? That's okay. my Thank you. So my, my, when I talk about the core of Freemasonry, I'm really talking about it, its rituals and the meaning and symbolism the esoteric nature behind those rituals. And of course, the progression of our degrees. What I'm not talking about, what I wouldn't include in the core, is how we manage our lodges. And they arise from our rules um, and our history and our culture. So for me, the core is about the values, the meaning, the purpose, the rituals. The wrappers around it are how we organize and manage our lodges. And uh, 
I believe we need to update the management of our lodges in the same way that every membership organisation has to update itself. I gave the example of scouting. Um, we, we had found in the scout movement that we were in decline. We were in serious decline uh, going into the 1990s. And we spent much of those years um, really looking at how we resolve that. And since, since we addressed those issues and changed the way we manage and structure and organize the scout movement, we've been on a growth path since we implemented those changes in 2003. So for me, when you say how much, I have to, I have to start by defining I, what I, for me, is the boundary. So the boundary is between the, the core purpose of Freemasonry and, and as, it's, as communicated through its rituals and its degree structure, and then the membership experience, which is how we organize our lodges, how we manage them, how we create a membership experience in our meetings. So all of those latter parts, I would say, um, are things that you could change. But what you change in each lodge is really up to each lodge. So I encourage all lodges to take stock, to review, to ask themselves whether what they're doing today is appropriate for today and tomorrow's members. And by today's members, I include all. I'm not just talking about young men. I'm talking about all members. And you know, we, we need to ask ourselves in each of our lodges whether or not our current practices are serving the needs of our current and likely future members and how we can adapt those practices to create a better and a more worthwhile, a more appreciated experience. For me, um, how much is not so much um, the quantity, it's more about the rate at which we do it and it's more about taking everybody with us to ensure uh, that we've got that the we're being inclusive and and uh, you know we we maintain if you like a lodge uh, which is for everyone. But it, it could be very little. It could be a great deal, and and it will vary from lodge to lodge. I think the final comment I'll make here um, is my my comments here are directed at lodges. I'm not making a wholesale um, uh, campaign to to change Freemasonry at the at the top level. If I've got any thoughts about that, I direct those to senior members of of the uh, of the United Grand Lodge or my provinces or whatever. So my comments here are are aimed at lodges. I just want to clarify that, Brendan. Harsha, I know you've got a second question. Um, I'm conscious that there are a few questions in the chat area, and there's a few more people with hands up. May I come back to you for your second one, just to rotate and give other people a chance? If you have the time. Thank you, Tony. Thank, uh, thank you, my brother. Thank you. Uh, can I go on to Dennis then? Dennis Heath. Dennis, are you still there? I think we could take sorry, one from Sorry, the, yeah, okay. Okay. I wasn't being allowed to unmute, but now I am uh, I am live. Thank you. Hello, Dennis. Your question. <laughs> yes, Worship Brother Tony, thank you for a very relevant presentation. Um, I've also I've just purchased your book. It arrived yesterday, oh, so I'm looking forward to to reading that. And you've mentioned uh, throughout your your presentation the the challenge of resistance. And one of the one of the issues that, that we face and that I've encountered on more than one occasion is that senior brother in a lodge who is violently against any kind of change, even the smallest change, you know, if you try to introduce, you know, we're, we're going to have salad for starters at festive board instead of soup. And he says, we've had soup since 1962. It's not going to happen. Um, and it really is sometimes that that trivial any change is fiercely fiercely resisted and unfortunately sometimes it is one of the most senior uh, brothers in the lodge and so when he takes that stance the rest of the brethren go oh yeah yeah oh, okay then uh, we we won't do that because we don't want to upset you um, how do you deal with that kind of individual who absolutely will not tolerate the slightest change? 
I'd be interested in your experience fantastic of question. with those people. Yes, fantastic question, Dennis. And, you know, I could write a book on this. In fact, I have. It's one of the chapters in the book, rather. <laughs> um, but what I, what I suggest is, uh, first of all, when, when, when we, and we've all encountered these issues, and, and I love the example you give, because, you know, it, it can be the most trivial. But it's, it, for the person concerned, it, it may have, it may represent all sorts of things. And uh, I think the start point has to be understand that person. Mm-hmm. Whoever's resisting change, understand that person. Spend time listening to them, asking them what what is important to them about the lodge, asking them about their memory their their memory of 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 the lodge and how they got into the lodge. And and as you listen, and as you um, yeah, and I wouldn't try to change anything at this point. I would really right. just try to download as much of their experience and and process your understanding of that experience. But you might then find some hooks. You might then find some some things that are particularly important to them. And remember my comment earlier, that it doesn't tend to be change that people don't like, it's lost. And you may well find that what what this person is fearing, some sense of loss. So if you can find that, if you can find that, that's, that's an important start point. But where do you go from there? Um, you mentioned about, you know, in the example you gave, you know, we've done this since such and such. If you can look at, if you can look at the evolution of the lodge or help that person look at the evolution of the lodge over time, you'll often find that some of the current traditions were actually introduced at a certain point in the lodge. Um, it may have been, I'll give you an example. Um, here, for example, a lot of our lodges um, have traditionally met at five o'clock or even earlier in the afternoon. But if you go back in Masonic history, you'll see that many of our lodges met quite later. The reason a lot of lodges, and it's changing again now, but the reason a lot of our lodges met earlier in the evening or late in the afternoon was because at the uh, outbreak of the Second World War in September 1939, Grand Lodge wrote to all lodges asking them to meet earlier so as not to... um, create targets effectively for um, bombers flying overhead through the lights. And many lodges just didn't move back to their former practices. Now, when you find, that's just one example, when you find that there was a point in history that led to something that's happening currently, and you can demonstrate that, look, we have evolved before. The thing that you are holding on to was not always part of our history. We adopted that at a particular time because of, for a particular reason. Our reason for that no longer exists, and therefore there is good reason for us to review and to come up with something that is more appropriate, more relevant, and more suitable for the people who are members today. And that that, that leads me on to another point that you often find. You often will find that the person who's most resistant is somebody who introduced a change themselves some years ago, and the change you want to make is to the change that they introduced. Now that, that can be a double-edged sword. <laughs> you can you can then use that as a way of saying, well, look, you know, you you were introducing things. You when you were the director of ceremonies or the secretary or whatever, you were coming, you kept the lodge going by coming up with new ideas. And that's all we want to do. We want to build on and continue your work. Um, but you know, this is where sensitivity obviously comes in. And, uh, and it, it, but it's all based upon understanding the man and understanding his thinking and his reasoning and what he's fearing uh, and then helping to work with him. And what I've also found is that sometimes you can reignite that sense of uh, wanting to contribute um, and, 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 and get people to then actually think about a change themselves that they think would be more appropriate. Most of us have things, have ideas in our minds as to, how something in our lodge could be could be improved upon. Brethren, there's a lot more that I could say about this issue. Um, I, I, I can't give a comprehensive answer um, in, in one go without uh, going on for a lot, lot longer. Um, so, uh, but I hope that's enough, Dennis, to, to keep us going. And if I can refer you back to the book again, um, there's some good material in there about this very issue. 
Can I can I move on to Neil? Neil Dolson. Neil, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, uh, thank you, Brother Tony. Always interesting to listen to you. And uh, to change one of the one of the only constants we have in our life, isn't it? Indeed. When, when we when we talk about change within a lodge and having a conversation that's inclusive of of many, if not all, members. When you look at the diversity of opinions that exist in those members, what's the best way of managing that discussion? Is it is it an outside moderator that has an independent view of of the lodge that is able to uh, direct the conversation impartially, or is there a way of finding somebody within the lodge to to moderate that discussion? And and if I if I could sneak this in, is change the same as long range planning? <laughs> is it the same discussion? Okay, well let's let let's take the substantive question first because I think it's an excellent question, Neil. And I earlier on in this before the talk, I I mentioned my reasons for my um you know the work I did in both Sri Lanka and uh, and in India were both when I was um uh, doing some work as a facilitator um for a client where I was helping them to make future decisions and build a a, a new approach to something. My role as a facilitator was to provide them with a process and to manage that process to make sure it was inclusive, to make sure uh, that we built consensus and to make sure that we built plans that were um, could be not only implemented, but also reviewed and uh, uh, ensured they succeeded. What I didn't do was have any role in deciding the content of those plans. It wasn't for me to be party to the decisions. So as a facilitator, uh, I spent, I've spent a lot of time working as a facilitator and still do for clients. And that's, I think, what you're referring to, Neil, isn't it? Haven't you, right, you yes. used the term moderator? I, I, I prefer the term in this facilitator. Um, and uh, that's a personal preference. But uh, I think it's very helpful to have an outside facilitator help a lodge through the process so that all members of the lodge can participate with their views and opinions and ideas, in other words, sharing their content. Because if you don't, if you have a member of the lodge try to manage the process, then either that person can't contribute their ideas on the same, in the same way, or they can be accused, sometimes rightly so, of skewing or, or, or um, preferring their vested interests and, and, and uh, biasing the whole thing. So it's very useful, particularly if there's a lot of difference of opinion, it's very useful to have a facilitator. And in fact, as provincial membership officer for in Nottinghamshire here, um, I have a team of people who do exactly that. They act as facilitators to lodges. They work with lodges to facilitate their, the lodge planning process. Which brings me to your last question, is change really about long-term planning? Uh, yes, uh, in a sense. Um, I, I'm a great believer in, a, in a planning, um, uh, uh, planning loops. So the idea of um, all planning is, is to create a new future, uh, to, to do something, you know, to, to do some, to determine what you're going to do in the future and then to enact it. But that should always include a review and then a refresh. And I would encourage your lodges to, to, to undertake this process on a continuous basis, on a, you know, every so often to take stock, reflect, review, replan, um, and to and to amend those things to ensure that the lodge stays fresh, thriving, fit for the future. Uh, my answer, Neil, I hope. Uh, um, I, I hope the idea of a facilitator is one that uh, um, you know you, you you find not only acceptable, but that you can find people who could act in those roles. Thank you. Thank Brother, you. we'll take one last question. Uh, Rajesh, could you unmute yourself and ask uh, Tony the question, please? Rajesh, are you there? Um, I know there's a number of questions in the chat area, George, and uh, 
perhaps oh. not given. I'm just scanning them at the moment. I, I don't know how much. I, I, um, I, I didn't realize that we we needed to stop so soon. But um, do you want to pick one of the questions out from the chat area? Uh, hi, uh, oh, worshipful Rajesh's... brother Tony. My yeah. apologies, Rajesh. Hello. I just I just got uh, my unmute button working. Hi. So uh, loved your presentation. Thank you so much. Greetings from Thank India. You. Thank uh, you. My question is that the first part of your presentation talks about increasing membership. With the stagnating membership, we need to ignite an interest among public to come in and join Freemasonry. How does that happen when the general public is not aware of Freemasonry across the board? Uh, there are fantastic candidates whom I've spoken with. I have personally uh, gotten about uh, eight or nine uh, brothers who've gone on to senior ranks in uh, GLI. How allowed are we to publicize about Freemasonry? Are we making a kind of a movement to, uh, like the pre 1940s you were mentioning, uh, that, you know, it was open. It was open for everybody to know about Freemasonry. Are we going to do that again? Okay. So can I just start with your uh, initial premise? Um, yes, I am very concerned and interested in membership. Um, my concern um, is, is, is not purely about numbers. It, it, it's about offering Freemasonry to today's men so that today's men can benefit from what Freemasonry teaches them and the manner in which it enhances their life. But for me, the issue about membership is not about finding more candidates. Um, I've done an extensive analysis of United Grand Lodge data, and I can't comment on uh, data for other constitutions, but my data has included our districts, uh, or my analysis of data has included our districts. And, and the lesson is this, it's very simple. The challenge of membership is largely to do with fixing what I call the leaky bucket. The leaky bucket is where um, however many new members you put in at the top, we're losing more through the through holes in the bottom. In other words, the reason we are, we are declining in membership is not because we're not recruiting new people. It's because we're losing more people than we bring in. So you have to ask the fundamental question, why are we losing so many people? And my belief is we're losing them because we're not creating great Masonic experiences which satisfy their expectations. Now, we the research we've done here have identified nine different reasons why people wish to join Freemasonry. And we've been very successful at bringing in new members. And I'll come back to that point to address the other part of your question. We've been very successful at bringing in new people, but there's no point bringing them in to lodges that fail them. And that is why my concern is to help lodges to, to modernize their, their internal management, uh, those things outside of the core that I was referring to earlier, in order to create a great Masonic experience so that people feel they're part of something that is inclusive, uh, where they can contribute, where they can gain benefit, um, and where they can truly be a band of brothers or whatever you wish to call it. So my belief is we, we've got to get that bit right. We've got, to, we've got to get the lodge management right to create those experiences. Now, when it comes to uh, finding new members, actually, when you do that, when you create great experiences in lodges, when you fix the leaky bucket, the members are your biggest marketing asset. The members talk to other members. Sorry, uh, uh, the members talk to friends. The members talk to family. And that is the most helpful way. In fact, again, our research shows us that nine out of 10 people who join membership organizations join because somebody spoke to them about that organization, not through external marketing. Now, we uh, in UGLE, at least here in England and Wales, have invested considerably in external marketing. But the reason for that has not just been to draw more people to Freemasonry, it's to tell the world what we are, to um, overcome the myths 
uh, the negativity that developed after the Second World War. And the reason it developed, I think, was because we went silent. And in going silent, we created this vacuum and, and, that, and that allowed suspicion to breed. But we've now shifted that. We've returned to the policy of openness, which we had pre-Second World War. And what that is showing is that the more people know about us, the more people understand what we why what we exist for, what we what we um, what we seek to do, um, that the better the the public perception of us has been, and that's what our marketing work is really all about: improving, clarifying, and improving public perception. And once we do that, then it's easier for our members to talk to their friends and family because they've got they've got a more positive base to work from. And that's where we really see the benefits of of, of um, marketing and that because it helps people bring new people in. There's another key point about this. If we're talking to people who are not Freemasons about Freemasonry, we should use their language and not the language of the ritual. Um, I'll just drop that there because um, I've got another talk on that, uh, which is called Have We Anything to Communicate? Um, probably... I'm probably used up all my time and I, I, I do apologize for that, but Rajesh, I hope that addresses your question. If I can finish my answer to that question by saying, I'm very sensitive to the fact that I'm speaking from a very UK centric position and that there are in parts of the world, um, other uh, situations and circumstances which make it very difficult for members and the organization itself to be as present in the public domain. So, you know, please temper my answer with an understanding of, of, of those local circumstances, which you will have and which I don't. Thank you. Well, George, thank I'm back in your hands. Thank you so much for that wonderful session, brethren. We understand there are quite a few more questions that you want to address. Uh, since we have brethren attending from Canada on one side to Thailand on the other. We've got very different time zones. It's quite late for many of our brethren. So in that uh, context, we would like to wind up the live session. Uh, we constrained to do that. However, kindly address all further questions to learning at dglofmadras.org and we shall endeavor to answer them through Worshipful Brother Tony. I, if, I thank you for that opportunity, George. I, I would very much like to continue to engage um, and if, if people want to submit a written question, I'll do my best. Absolutely. We would definitely like to keep our engagement going. Um, may I now request Worshipful Brother Matthew Joseph, Deputy District Grand Master, for his uh, closing comments, please. Worshipful Brother. Brother Matthew, you're on mute. Yeah. Yes, you're audible now. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Brother George Jacob. Um, right, Worshipful District Grandmaster, right, Worshipful Brethren, very Worshipful Brethren, Worshipful Brethren, Brethren, and all. The fact that we have over 131 plus people sitting in on a Sunday evening and afternoon in some places, evenings in other places, listening to this uh, lecture speaks volumes, not only of our speaker, Virtual Brother Tony Harvey, but also of the concern and the realization across districts across the world of Freemasonry, that there is an urgent need to understand what strategies to put in place um, to keep Freemasonry fresh, and growing. Like Vashul Brother Tony Harvey uh, mentioned, change is inevitable, but it is necessary. And at the same time, I think it is up to each lodge to find its own solution because each lodge has its own culture, each lodge has its own uh, barriers. Like I think one of the brethren was mentioning about senior brethren and uh, you know, these kind of blocks that come up in the way. But that, I think, is true of any organization where you have people who are resistant to change, primarily because 
they do not feel secure or maybe they feel that they will lose importance in the lodge since they have been establishing traditions in the lodge. So Virtual Brother Tony Harvey's presentation was extremely thought provoking and forces us to relook at practices and traditions that we have in each lodge. And I think it's very clear that we should not assume that there is a one answer fit all lodges. We should look at each lodge, look at what the culture in the lodge is, what is what makes the brethren tick and say that, okay, this is what I want. And if this happens, um, then I would be a more active Mason. And I think it's also relevant to point out the other thing that uh, Brother Tony had mentioned that the leaky bucket, I think that is also very true of a lot of lodges. Retention of membership is very, very crucial. There's no point us adding members in the top and then finding at the end of the year that we are still at the same numbers because we have lost a substantial number at the bottom. So I, um, one of the messages I think that we need to enforce, which could be blanket across lodges, is to make Freemasonry visible, recognized, and respected. I think this is uh, this uh, sort of fits almost any lodge. Once you make it visible, you have members wanting to um, uh, wanting to get involved. You you have others wanting to join, and and then also the whole uh, concept of evolving each lodge evolving on its own so that it can thrive. I think our district membership officer can, as they call it in modern term, hashtag evolve to thrive, to thrive, you know? So I think, uh, and this is something that only a lodge can find a solution on its own. I don't think we have that um, as a ready-made answer um, if, uh, in any book, in any textbook, something that each lodge has to find on its own. Um, so thank you very much, Virtual Brother Tony Harvey, and uh, I'm sure all of us will go with a lot of thoughts, a lot of minds, and you know, as we as this uh, particular session was going on, the lodge that I belong to, Ashbal Campbell Lodge, our, uh, our senior warden was texting me already, planning out his strategies for when he becomes Worshipful Master. So I think the thought process is on. So thank you very much. That's a, a real pleasure, and. and... Thank you for inviting me and thank you brethren all for making me so welcome and responding so positively to what I have to say. I would love the opportunity to be able to uh, come and speak to you in person um, and I'm very open to making that happen if uh, somebody would like to work with me, whether that's to um, um, you know, one district or, or a number of districts. Um, so I'm very, very keen to, to engage face to face with as many brethren as possible. Um, George, I don't know whether you want to pick that up or somebody else like to pick that up, but I'll leave that in your hands to, to initiate if, uh, if possible. Thank you so much, uh, Tony, for that offer. We will definitely look you up on that. Thank you so much, Virtual Brother Matthew Joseph, for those truly inspiring words. May I now request Virtual Brother T.P. George, District Grand Secretary, to propose a word of thanks. Good evening, brethren. Uh, Thank you, George. Uh, right Worshipful District Grand Master, Worshipful uh, Deputy District Grand Master, Worshipful Assistant District Grand Master, Most Worshipful Brethren, Right Worshipful Brethren, Very Worshipful Brethren, and Brother-in-law. First and foremost, our sincere gratitude to Worshipful Brother Tony for taking time out of his busy calendar and joining us this evening to speak to all of us. Worship Brother, it's been a very inspiring session, very informative, relevant, and engaging. Thank you on behalf of the entire District Grand Lodge of Madras. Uh, today we have a brethren from across the world. Uh, so a big thank you to everybody who's uh, joined us this evening for this wonderful session. Um, we have with us uh, the District Grand Masters of the Eastern Archipelago, Dr. Jairaj Ratnaswamy, the Right Worshipful District Grand Master of Sri Lanka, Right Worshipful Brother Farad Melikriya, the uh, Right Worshipful Assistant District Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Georgia, Right Worshipful Brother David Chinchi Nadze. Uh, we have uh, Most Worshipful Brother Jacques Hubert, uh, the past Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of the Czech Republic, 
We also have with us uh, Worshipful Brother uh, Chris Adams, who is the Assistant District Grand Master of the District Grand Lodge of South Africa North. So we have with us uh, very distinguished brethren. Thank you all for joining us. I'm sure all of you have enjoyed uh, Worshipful Brother Tony's uh, session with us. Uh, and uh, last but not the least, uh, I'd like to thank all the brethren from our district who have uh, taken time out and uh, made this a very uh, wonderful uh, meeting this evening. And of course, to our LND team who are uh, doing a wonderful job, Brother George Jacob and his entire team. I think uh, you know you've uh, brought us uh, a very special evening today, and thank you for that. Um, it's my fervent hope that. Uh, all of us have something positive to take away from this evening and uh, to bring about some changes in our lodges. Thank you, brother. And thank you all. Thank you so much, Vashul, brother, for your kind words of encouragement. It's the immense confidence and encouragement of the district that has propelled us forward. We wish to thank, right, Vashul, the district and master for the visionary leadership and the entire executive leadership of the district for their presence and great support. Once again, brethren, Thank you so much for making time to attend the module. We now look forward to being back with you soon with some remarkably interesting modules which we are currently casting in our foundry. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.